Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the seventh meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Um, just to let folks know, James Cayley may, may join us as the, we proceed this morning. James has been a bit delayed because of the, the weather conditions, I think, on the rail side of things, so hopefully he'll be able to make it for at least part of our proceedings. Uh, the usual story for mobile phones, please, please put them in a mode that won't interfere with our proceedings. Uh, and the first item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence on the Planning Scotland Bill Financial Memorandum. And we're joined for, the, for this session by Tammy Swift Adams, who's the Director of Planning of Homes for Scotland, David Wood, who's the Manager of the Planning and Policy at PAS, Craig McLaren, who's the Convener of the Royal Town Planning Institute for Scotland, and John Hamilton, who's the Chair of the Scottish Property Federation. Welcome to you all, and, and thank you for coming along this morning to take part in the proceedings. We'll just get straight into questions. And I just wonder, there are a number of issues raised in your various written submissions, including issues around the funding of local place plans, the introduction of an infrastructure levy, the level of detail that might appear in secondary legislation, etc. I, I just wonder if each of you could outline what you consider to be your main concern regarding the estimates contained in the f financial memorandum or any of the pro proposals therein. So who'd like to kick that off? David, fire away. Yeah, good morning, uh, committee, and thanks for having inviting Paz to give evidence. Um, I'll keep this fairly short. As you probably know, we are a charity and social enterprise operating throughout Scotland, and our main remit is to help local people, local communities get involved in the planning system and the places around them. And we very much see the planning reform agenda as part of the whole community empowerment agenda uh, from Scottish government about giving local people a voice in their places. Our specific interest in the financial memorandum was in the local place plans um, aspect, as you will see. Uh, we think that's a very exciting opportunity um, for uh, people to have a get involved at a local level in plan making in their places. We have commented on resourcing, which I think we'll come back to, and we very much would see that resourcing question as part of the whole wider context, which a lot of respondents have mentioned about the actual resourcing of the, the plans of, of the planning system in order to make reform uh, successful and achieve the, the aim of having uh, public trust and more local involvement in the planning system. Thank you much, David. Tammy? Um, in terms of the financial memorandum, I think there's key aspects of the reform that are still to be worked out in detail and that the financial memorandum hasn't really been able to, to cost. Um, the levy is an example of that, but also the, the way in which planning fees are, are put in place in the future and also the costs to all parties for collaborative, um, collaborative development planning. Um, so the financial memorandum hasn't been able to cost those, so it doesn't really serve as a very useful tool to look at what will the overall cost be on developers and development, but on other sectors as well. And I know there's concern amongst quite a lot of parties that it doesn't help local authorities gear up for a more collaborative, more proactive planning system and there's a risk of it being used um, by local authorities to find um, cost savings or cuts to departments, which I'm sure others will, will mention. Um, I think our main concern is the potentially the nature of the infrastructure levy that's been described in the financial memorandum and the, the policy memorandum. It's not what we'd envisaged through the planning review process, which is a, a, a more a, an ability to have a clearer approach to develop contributions to pool that and spend that across a a local authority area or maybe a sub-region. Um, it's more along the land, the land value tax model, which um, isn't something that's been significantly discussed to date. So I'd say the, the nature of the levy is our main concern. Greg? Yeah, uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, I suppose our, our concern, um, or, or the issue I'd like to highlight uh, initially, is the fact that there's a, there's a bit of a lack of clarity in terms of the resourcing for the planning system uh, through the financial memorandum and what this new, this new planning system will look like. The, the planning service and the planning system is under a hell of a lot of um, scrutiny just now, and it's, there's a lot of issues in terms of the resourcing. And I could give you some figures to, to, to give you an example of that. Um, in the last, since 2009, we've seen a 23% decrease in planning staff in local authorities. Um, we have um, seen, uh, just according to figures published by the Improvement Service recently, the uh, decrease of 33% in terms of investment over the last seven years in planning services. It's one of the highest decreases across all services in local government. 
We've done some work from uh, looking at Scottish government figures, which shows that the uh, average amount of money from a local authority budget that goes into planning, the planning service just now in development management, development planning, <laughs> is 0.44 per cent of the total budget. Um, and there's all, that's combined with the fact that if you um, pay a planning fee for a planning application, it only meets 63% of the cost of processing that application. So we're in very difficult times. We're heading towards a crisis, I think, in terms of, of um, a resource in the planning system. So we need to make sure that the financial memorandum actually gives us some clarity. And, and we're worried that some aspects of it don't provide that. An example of that is the, the bit in it which talks about um, a saving between 17 million and 25.5 million uh, from moving to from five-year development plans to 10-year development plans. That's not saving, because that money will still be needed to actually deliver the development plans. Um, but some people have read it as a saving, and I'm particularly worried that financial directors and local authorities will see it as a saving, because it shouldn't be. So that clarity uh, against that backdrop of increasing and severe pressures on resourcing and planning authorities is, uh, is the key issue for us. Thanks, Craig. John? Uh, good morning. Um, I'm the former uh, chair of the, the SPF. Um, I was also a, a member of the independent panel uh, set up by the Scottish Government in 2016 for the, the review of the planning system. Um, the SPF's main concerns, I think, are similar to uh, what Tammy outlined in, in terms of uh, infrastructure and the lack of detail in the financial memorandum and indeed in the, in the draft bill on how infrastructure is to be funded and uh, the way that costs have been calculated in the financial memorandum in the absence of any analysis on economic benefits. There are very substantial cost estimates which are included in the memorandum uh, which move towards uh, uh, developers and the private sector funding. Um, I think without having a, a wider analysis of how the viability of projects will be taken forward and what the economic benefits of the changes that have been considered it's difficult to, to get a view as to whether or not the uh, proposed legislation is going to have the benefits that uh, are intended. Um, in the, the planning review, there were fairly uh, firm recommendations. There were a number of quite strong recommendations concerning the creation of uh, an infrastructure agency or an infrastructure uh, commission. Um, we are concerned that these are absent from uh, from the, the draft bill, uh, they're not dealt with in the, in the financial memorandum, and uh, I think these are, are quite serious omissions from the original uh, report that was made in 2016 on how the bill has now been taken forward. And obviously, our job is around the financial memorandum, not so much the policy content. But but if you, when the infrastructure levy, it's, and I'm going to come to Murdo Fraser in, in, in a minute on that issue, the uh, paragraph. 87 in the financial memorandum it outlines how the government would intend to take that discussion forward uh, before making use of the powers ministers are committed to undertaking a full assessment and collaboration with COSLA and other stakeholders. They go on to talk about viability of developments, economic growth issues and what the regulations will be. Would you accept though that, there's, that the government recognises there's still significant further work to be done here in recognising some of the concerns you've raised and, of the, and they've outlined how they intend to deal with that in the memorandum? Yes, we, we acknowledge that uh, there are uh, proposals there that would be uh, taken through uh, secondary legislation. I think we, we feel that uh, the timing of the, of the bill, I think more, we feel that more work should have been done on uh, what the output and uh, the reality of uh, the proposals would be without uh, necessarily uh, proceeding with uh, primary legislation uh, with these matters uh, not dealt with. But if, I, if I've got this right, they're only at this stage giving themselves an enabling power yeah, and enabling are committing powers. themselves to that full assessment that you're asking for. Yeah. Am I right in that? Well, yes, except for, you know, as I say, there are omissions that we feel are important to be taken forward on the creation of an infrastructure agency. Um, we feel those are, are key points that uh, should have been uh, given more uh, clarity and more uh, uh, importance at this stage of the bill. Okay, thank you. Murdo. <coughs> thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. I, I'm interested in following up some of these points the Convener's already raised about the, the infrastructure levy. Um, 
I think we're, we'll be familiar with the Section 75 uh, procedure, whereby you know, local authorities will seek to again develop our contributions for you know, infrastructure, for education, for various other um, local amenities. Uh, this is clearly intended to be an infrastructure levy that will be on top of that, because I can't imagine local authorities, Mr. McLaren's nodding, will want to lose any income from developer contributions. So, c can you say any more about what sense you, you've been given um, about what sort of uh, rate that infrastructure levy might might be set at, or is that something that is still to be determined? There hasn't been inf um, where there isn't any clear information on what the rate might be, but there's a clear indication that it's intended to be based on a, a proportion of the land value that arises through planning. And um, obviously that would vary depending on the type of development and where it is, but it's it's that issue that, that's one of our main concerns. You know, that's we were anticipating a levy similar to SIL in England that's based on um, a costed assessment of what infrastructure is needed to support development in the area. Um, and then that cost balanced against the viability of, of bringing forward development in a particular area. That's, you know, it's not dissimilar or that far removed from Section 75 or Section six, uh, 106 in England. What's set out as the anticipated model in the financial memorandum and the policy memorandum is something based on, on land value uplift, as I say. So that, that's quite a significant departure in the policy approach to developer contributions. Um, which is partly why we think this bill is premature. There's been discussions on a levy, but never any discussions on the levy being put in place on that basis. I th I th one of the things that the, um, uh, the financial memorandum and the, 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 the research into the, um, the infrastructure levy, it says there'll be roughly between 30 million to 50, 70 million pounds um, uh, generated a year by it. I keep getting told by people who are closer to than I am that that's about two and a half schools, which isn't exactly the um, transformational change which we need in terms of infrastructure. Infrastructure is incredibly important. I talk to members uh, from uh, RTPI, from the private sector and from the public sector. They both tell me that they cannot afford to uh, fund the schools, the nurseries, the doctor's surgeries, the roads, the infrastructure which we need. And it's getting to a bit of a, a crux point, I think, in that we're getting to the stage where there's large housing developments uh, going through the planning system and no one can afford this infrastructure. So can I just ask you a question? Sorry to interrupt. Yes, sir. You, you mentioned a figure that, that's been talked about. Yeah. Who's talking about that? Where's that information coming from? That, that, was, that was in research published by Scottish Government, which was undertaken by Peter Brett Associates. It's on the Scottish Government website, okay, which looked uh, behind the, the, the infrastructure okay. levy. Thank you. Sorry, um, but yeah, I suppose my point is that um, we need something different, which is uh, going to provide a much more, uh, a, a much bigger pot to allow us to have that transformational change in terms of infrastructure, because no one's got the cash just now, no one's got the money. Um, so we, we need to see how that works. Tammy's mentioned stuff like land value uplift. I think Scottish Government are interested in that. They're looking at it. Uh, and land value uplift, where if you give planning permission to to someone, the land value rises um, because of that permission, because it's it's, it's uh, it, because it's got a, a particular use. Uh, and that's about seeing how you can actually maybe retain some of that money and use that for infrastructure and the public good, not just for the person who owns the land. Yeah, sorry, Ms. McLaren. I just wanted to, 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 to try and get a better understanding of this because what, what I'm not clear is whether whether the infrastructure levy is money that will be collected collect to a central pot and then distributed, for example, to local authorities through the normal disbursement process, or whether it will be collected at a local level and tied to specific development um, projects in the vicinity of any particular land that's being developed. Can you provide any clarity on that, or is that still but, but My understanding is it will be centralised, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and Section 75 agreements will be still collected at a yeah. local level. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to come in on that because oh. the, uh, I agree that you know that was uh, uh, a recommendation made uh, in 2016 that the collection would be centralised. I think that there, there is a, a question being raised though um, as to who would actually uh, collect uh, the, the contributions. I believe there is uh, potentially some issues with uh, whether a central government has uh, the powers to raise that sort of funding or whether it would be collected by at local authority level, um, the SPF would have a you know major concern with collection being made at local authority level rather than at central level. Um, that has proven to be a, a problem in England with SIL contributions. Um, we would anticipate that if contributions are being collected uh, 
through local authorities, then they'll be seen as another layer of Section 75 contributions, and it'll be difficult to get accountability at a national or a regional level as to how that money's been collected and, and spent. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, anybody else want to come in? If they've not got a follow-up question. Yeah. yeah. It's just um, it's another example of how the levy, as envisaged um, in the papers, is different to the one that we were assuming would come forward through consultation. Um, the problem with infrastructure, in terms of the money that's collected and, and spent locally at the moment, the problem is you can't sometimes pool that in the way authorities at the local and sub-regional level might like to do. So there's, a, there's an obvious problem there that there's an opportunity to overcome. The levy in here goes far beyond that by saying, I mean, I think, if I'm right, local authorities would collect the money, but it would then go centrally to government, who would redistribute it around Scotland, not necessarily back to where where the contributions arose for, which is, again, it's a big, a big policy departure. Can I just tease that bit again? Yeah, sure, yeah. Because it also says, in paragraph 89 of the financial memorandum, this envisages the infrastructure levy would aim to capture a proportion of the increase in land value attributed to development, and the levy receipts would be used to fund infrastructure which supports the development. So that would seem to suggest that the money, it, although it's being raised nationally, is actually being applied locally to support the development that's ongoing. Is that not right? Is that not the, what you understand as well, Tammy? It's what's envisaged, but it's not what's set out in the bill. So the bill powers, and I guess it's just to keep options open. Um, well, of course, it's an could email. you could you could come forward with any any type of levy? So that that's the policy intention set out. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Mother. So yeah. So the, this might be a question that's even more for the minister than, than for the panel. But I'm interested to get your view on it. You know. It, if, if it's a, 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 in effect a new levy being collected centrally, coming to Scottish government, being dispersed on a basis we don't currently know, you know, if I were the finance secretary in the Scottish government, I might think this is a bonus, extra cash I'm getting, and I can displace funding I was going to put into infrastructure and spend it on other things, and just use this money um, instead. So in effect, it, it wouldn't be putting any new money into infrastructure; it's just replacing money that's already there. Is that? Is that a legitimate concern, or am I, am I chasing hairs? I think that's a concern in the absence of a, in an accountable body who would be uh, uh, in charge of uh, uh, accounting for for that level of you know that that uh, that income, and that's why we uh, we felt that uh, an infrastructure commission, in the absence of an infra infrastructure agency, would be uh, you know essential, you know, to uh, have that accountability. Okay. I would agree. I think you have to guard against that just being sucked up and the Scottish Government using it as a, a replacement. One of the things which um, is perhaps missing from the debate is um, how this could be made to work at a regional level, um, be that intermediate between the local level and, and the, uh, the Scottish Government level, because it's meant to be about strategic infrastructure, this. The problem with that is that the bill is proposed is trying to, going to get rid of strategic development plan authorities, um, uh, and we need to try and make sure we get arrangements in place at that level, which I think could help with uh, the disbursement and the collection of the um, infrastructure levy if it goes ahead. Patrick, sorry. Uh, good morning. Could I just quickly follow up on on that last point that um, Mr. Hamilton uh, and Murdo Fraser were discussing there? Uh, you, Mr. Hamilton, you, you said that there would need to be an accountable body. The Scottish Government is an accountable body. It's democratically accountable to this Parliament uh, for decisions that it makes, uh, including potentially the decision that uh, it wants to spend additional money on other things that the community also needs, other forms of public spending. What, Nate, what kind of accountable body are you talking about that would be more democratically accountable than government is to Parliament? Well, the, qu the question's been, been asked of us by MSPs and panel, um, so you know it's not only a question which the the, uh, the SPF are, are making. Um, I think I'd also uh, you know refer to uh, key agencies in the, the planning system and and in the development process. There are numerous agencies involved in making contributions towards uh, de uh, development. Um, you know, there are public funds available to those agencies. There are also uh, private bodies, utility companies, who 
are required to be funded and uh, make investment in the planning system without having an overall coordination or, or any body that's coordinating you know, public sector and private sector funding in the development process, I think that will uh, present challenges. Yeah, yes, I appreciate that. We, all of these agencies and other bodies are, are further steps removed from the democratic accountability that government has to parliament. You said there would need to be an accountable body. How would it be more, more democratically accountable than government is? Um, well, as I said, you know, we haven't directly raised the, the question of democracy. We're raising the, the point about accountability and how that funding is spent. Um, Are they different? Well, I think another example which uh, can be made is, uh, you know, planning fees. Planning fees are collected uh, at local authority level. There, there's no compulsion, though, in local authorities to... They're democratically elected bodies. Yeah. They're not compelled to use planning fees, you know, directly 100% in the planning system. I think the point has been made here that there's no real difference, or there could be no real difference between that position and the collection of uh, infrastructure levies. Um, it'll be out with the remit of, you know, the collecting bodies if there's no uh, compulsion to spend that money in infrastructure, uh, in uh, identify programmes, then the money won't be spent there. I'm sorry, I still struggle to see how there's a lack of accountability in that kind of decision. But anyway. uh, Ivan, you want to go? You want to go into? Yeah. Sorry, somebody, somebody else wanted to respond to that Patrick's points. Yeah, I, mean, I was just thinking in terms of accountability. Somebody needs to be accountable for delivering infrastructure, and I think that's what's missing from the planning system at the moment. Um, and what we found under the SIL model in England is that because it's the local authorities that put SIL charges in place, put the levies in place and then collect the monies, they effectively become responsible for delivering infrastructure in a way that they weren't before. And it's not a role that they've been able to gear up to. And that's partly made the levy in England a barrier to development um, rather than an enabler of it. So in terms of accountability, I think what's important here is, and I understand the point about democracy, but if the democratically um, elected local authorities aren't able to or perhaps don't want to become infrastructure deliverers, somebody else needs to take on that role. That, that body doesn't exist at the moment, and they would be, need to be held accountable to making sure the money raised for infrastructure was spent on it in time for delivery. So I think there is an accountability um, accountable body missing at the moment, and I don't think local authorities are probably the best place people to, to take on that role. Uh, thanks, convener. Thanks, panel, for struggling through the snow this morning. Um, I, I, two or three points I wanted to pick up on. First of all, on the infrastructure levy, uh, and I appreciate very much what uh, Mr. McLaren is saying. Certainly, in my own constituency, we've got examples of significantly large housing developments continuing to be built. With, uh, with absolutely no plans for, for schools, doctors, etc., to be incorporated, community centres to be incorporated in those. So it's a significant issue. Just to clarify, are you saying that the numbers in the financial memorandum, the 35 to 75 million a year, uh, is not large enough to support what needs to be done and that you think that number should be should be bigger? The, um, the numbers which came from the research, this at 30 million to 70 yeah, million. Yeah, they're the uh, same numbers in the financial memorandum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they, um, yeah, I, I think when the modelling was done, I think there was a, um, a, a people thought that that's not quite the level which we need. If okay. we're going to have some transformational change in terms of infrastructure, we need okay. a bigger investment. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to clarify, the figures in the memorandum aren't intended to show what additional money is needed to plug the gap between what money comes from development now and what more is needed to fund infrastructure. It's just to show indicatively on a levy, assuming you want it to be put in place on a viable, at a viable level that allows development cont to continue, that's what's envisaged could be raised over and above what already comes from Section 75. So there's two answers to the question, really. No, the money in the fig in there isn't enough to fund Scotland infrastructure needs, but no, that doesn't mean that figure should be higher. It means there's another figure somewhere else that's the gap between what can viably come through development contributions and the rest of the money that's needed to fund infrastructure. And we haven't seen at the moment a modelling of the national infrastructure needs that you can use to see what that other figure or that gap is. 
but the answer isn't just increasing what comes from developer contributions. You've got to do it responsibly in the way that research is done and look at what's, what's viable, what's the maximum potential to take from development and then... No, I, I understand, I understand, yeah. but there, there yeah. is a, wherever the money comes from, there is a gap between yeah. what is envisaged will be raised and what you're saying is required and whether that comes from core Scottish Government funding or whatever. I uh, understand that point. Okay, thanks for that. Moving on, the second issue I wanted to, to raise um, with uh, Mr Hamilton round about the... There's a comment in the financial memorandum I'm reading here and it says that the um, Scottish Property Federation estimated that project costs in some cases could be reduced by 25 to 30%. Um, is that something you recognise in it? Well, obviously it's come from yourselves, I believe. Um, but that doesn't seem to appear in the financial memorandum anywhere, or am I missing something? Um, I'm not quite sure about the context of that statement. Um, right. You know, we don't anticipate a, a reduction in the, the cost of development. Um, in terms of infrastructure, you know, we, we would agree with the uh, uh, position that uh, uh, Craig takes and in terms of scale of development. I uh, work on a development in my day job, a development of uh, about 3,500 houses. Now, the infrastructure spend and Section 75 contributions on that pro project amount to close to 140 million. Mm -hmm. So, in scale, uh, you know, potentially per house, we're talking about a infrastructure and planning gain cost of typically 30 or 40 thousand pounds per uh, per house. Now, yeah. that goes nowhere near the kind of uh, figures that are set out in the memorandum as to uh, you know the, the amount of funding that'll be be produced through. Uh, through the, the new legislation. Sure, I understand it, but leaving that to one side, focus, focusing on this point about project costs. Mm -hmm. So you see, you're saying that you don't recognise that I don't quote re that's in uh, the financial memorandum? No, I don't recognise that. Okay. I mean, I mean, just to, for clarity to read out, the Scottish Property Federation has estimated that reducing delays and providing greater certainty to developers as the reforms are intended to do could reduce project costs in some cases by 25 to 30%. I think I think that's where we were looking at the uh, potential for making efficiencies in the in the planning system and, yeah. and making earlier delivery. Um, I think what we were commenting on there is um, typically with uh, house building organisations where they have a large number of projects and they have to make uh, they have to plan around what prospects they have of securing planning uh, consent in time. Um, organisations like that, companies like that have an annual business plan they have to focus on what business they can deliver uh, in every every year and I, I think what was being said there is that uh, if we have improvements in planning the planning service to improve uh, the time for uh, consenting planning along with all, all other uh, consents that are required for development then that potentially could reduce operational costs so that is correct? Well, it would be in that case where there's right. improved efficiencies. I think, uh, you know, the legislation is intended to create a better planning service, but, you know, we're not want, we don't want to confuse where we think added costs have been added in, in infrastructure on... The, no, I'm not talking yeah. about infrastructure, I'm talking yeah. about specifically on these project costs. Yes, yeah. on project uh, operational costs, I would say, would be where that saving would be would be made. Right. Yeah. Have you any idea how much that might come to? Because as far as I can see, it's not included anywhere in the financial memorandum. No, I, th I think for a house building organisation, uh, the, the main savings that will be uh, achieved there would be in, you know, the business overheads. Um, so, you know, most of the big UK house builders now operate on a regional level. Um, if they're built, you know, they may have £100 million worth of business in each region in the larger companies and their uh, overhead level could be something like seven or eight million pounds as part of that, that business. If they did achieve a 25% improvement in that, you know, each of these companies could, you know, achieve, say, two million pounds in savings. So you're talking about a reasonably significant number? It, it would be, you know, yeah. with that improvement okay. in efficiency, okay. yeah. Fine. So in the last... Sorry. I was just going to say, obviously, um, from Homes of Scotland perspective, there are other costs arising from the bill that aren't in the financial memorandum that would fall on the private sector, and it might not be an individual project costs, but 
beyond the levy that we've already talked about and the increase in um, developer contributions, there's potentially going to be increases in planning fees as they're set now, as well as fees for other types of development management activity, including some of the work undertaken and funded by the Scottish Government at the moment. Um, there's also going to be additional costs for preparing sites to promote them into a plan, particularly viability assessments. And there are other costs as well, just in terms of the culture that we all know we need to move towards if we want planning to be a more positive, collaborative and productive process. And that includes the costs of collaborating with the public sector and communities in the preparation of the NPF and LDFs, but also offering peer or customer input on performance work um, and making a contribution to councillor training. So I think you need to look beyond the the traditional planning things that happen at the moment, planning applications and site promotion for plans, the house building sector knows there's a lot more work that needs to be done to make planning work for them and for others. So again, none of that's costed, only the levies costed in the um, financial memorandum, but all those other costs exist. So those are additional costs that would incur to developers where this bill to go through? Yeah, they're, cost, they're things that don't cost money now that will in the future. Right, so to, just again to recap on this, in terms of financial memorandum, there's a bit missing here, which is the savings and project costs isn't included, and there's also a bit missing in terms of these additional costs that developers would have to occur, incur <coughs> to comply with the, the, the planning bill. Yeah. So there's at least two things missing. Okay. David was wanting it as well, Ivan. Yeah, just to quickly follow on, <coughs> follow on from Tammy, I think it's really worth remembering that the whole sort of issues of the planning reform process, housing and infrastructure and public trust are all linked up. A lot of public concern about new developments often expressed through the provision of infrastructure. So I think we can see getting the infrastructure question right as almost a matter of preventative spend, you know, allowing development to be delivered uh, more effectively and with an element of public trust if we can get this infrastructure question right. Okay, and sorry, and just <coughs> final point, um, I think, again, it's, it's, uh, Mr McLaren's probably has mentioned this already. When we're looking at what's on here for the, the, the planning authority, the local authority savings, um, there's a number in there, and I think it actually says it's a notional number. Um, so I think what they're saying there, correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you add up all the time saving, notional time saving and cost of it, you would come to this kind of number. And I think it also says, as you rightly said, that that doesn't necessarily mean that you can extract that number from the budget because, um, but, but what it should mean is that there's that value of time available for planners to then spend on other things, which in theory should, um, I, would under, I, I would expect, um, relieve the pressure that the planning system is under in other areas. Is that kind of how you would interpret that? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the key figure in there is the um, for the move from a five-year statutory five-year development plans to 10-year development plans. And that's something we've supported because um, it means you're not a constant, we want a constant cycle of us producing a new plan all the time. Um, and plans don't change that much, uh, to be honest with. There's certain areas and places which will change. So that move to a 10-year cycle is a good thing. But the premise of that was that it would free up staff from producing and consulting on the development plan to actually deliver the development plan. Um, the slight worrying thing for us is the way it can be sometimes read within the financial memorandum is that it's a saving because it's no longer attributed to a statutory function mm -hmm. of the planning service because the, the statutory function is okay. the, the production of, right. of the development plan, not the delivery of I it. I understand. Um, and I think we need to make sure that Scottish Government and others make that clear that okay. those there's not really a saving there at all. Okay. It's actually just transferring that from production to delivery, and that's a really important point. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Alexander? Thank you, convener. Uh, can I note my register of interest around development, house building and construction? Um, good morning, panel. Uh, Tammy, in the Homes for Scotland submission in uh, 4.6, uh, you mentioned concerns over no improvement or worse, a reduction in service uh, and the consequence of a slowing of delivery homes. Uh, I just wonder on this and the wider bill, uh, do you foresee an improved or an impaired delivery for what's being proposed? I don't think there's anything in the bill that provides any that could provide us with confidence that planning performance and particularly the way in which planning services support the delivery of, of new homes is going to improve. I think there's a huge amount of reliance on um, 
work that happens outside of the legislative framework, more, more collaborative work, but there's, there's not anything in place at the moment that um, guarantees home builders will have more of a role in, in development planning, which we think would help with, with making them more um, delivery focused. So in terms of what's on the face of the bill at the moment, no, and I think that's what we answered in the question, it, it's not guaranteed to help deliver more homes. Thank you. Can I come in there? Yeah. I, I think there's an important point you made here about um, how you measure the success of the planning system. Um, there's different criteria which are used. Um, the one which seems to be used generally um, is just the speed of processing planning applications. And that is important, undoubtedly it is, but there are other things which are important as well. The outcome which the decision has achieved is incredibly important as well. And there's, there's a thing called a planning performance frameworks, which are published by every local planning authority annually, which looks at a number of criteria and shows how they are performing against that, and they're marked by Scottish Government. And I think what we have seen over that Pete, over the last three or four years is that there has been an improvement in terms of the range of different criteria which are in there. Um, it, there's still work to be done, undoubtedly there's still work to be done, I think we all appreciate that. Um, and there's work to be done in improving the, the time skills for, for um, processing planning applications as well. But again, we need to try and make sure we invest in that. Um, just now there's very little money invested in that by, by Scottish Government. Local authorities put some money into a pot with improvement service which is matched by Scottish Government, which goes some way to it. But we've seen, for example, in England there's been a, a, new, pl a new delivery fund uh, announced um, of £25 million, which is to help people to deliver housing. And that's focused on things such as how you can increase partnership working, how you can reduce innovation in your processes and your services, um, and, and how you can improve the design of places as well. Um, we've got nothing of that scale in Scotland just now. Uh, I'd love, to, I know it's difficult, I'd love to have something like that because I think it could make a difference and it could be a bit of a game changer as well. Okay, Neil. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, good morning. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, cost to communities. Um, I know that the uh, Royal Town, uh, Town Planning Institute has said um, you got concerned about the failures of the financial memorandum to offer an estimated total cost of production of local place plans. I know Planning Aid Scotland have said communities must be resourced to deliver local place plans. Um, there's an estimate cost of nearly £12 million to communities in the financial memorandum. Can I just ask the panel, is, is that a realistic figure and is it a fair burden to put on local communities? I'm happy to take that first if that's okay. Um, I, I think that the, 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 the money, the, th the £12,000, £13,000 in the financial memorandum is, is a cost to, it's not necessarily to communities, but the cost of supporting communities. To, um, to produce local place plans. That's based on figures from down south uh, on how they've t taken forward uh, neighbourhood planning. Um, I think the, the fact of the matter is um, neighbourhood planning is a different thing from local place plans. There's, there's similarities but differences. Um, in Scotland, we've tended to go across the, lay, the, the route of um, using charrettes, community-focused workshops taking place over three or four days um, to start that discussion, start that dialogue about what people want, what people don't want, what the consequent constraints are, what the opportunities are, and who does what in taking that forward. From what we can hear, um, they cost between twenty and forty thousand um, pounds per event. Um, so, if you take an average of uh, thirty thousand pounds for them, and you want to have a local a number of local place plans in each local authority, if off the top of my head, if you're saying there's going to be three local place plans in each local authority, that's roughly a hundred local place plans. That's three million pounds all of a sudden. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's an issue to be looked at there as to how that can be funded. Uh, and if there has to be a, prior, a prioritisation in that, we would argue that it has to be best go to those areas where there's going to be most change and probably those areas where there's less support, more disadvantaged areas, uh, more areas which actually need to, uh, to, to benefit from planning as well. So th there's, a, there's a, a lack of... Um, th there's not a figure from Scottish Government. It would be good to hear what their figure is for Scotland as a whole, not just basing it on the neighbourhood plans. Yeah, um, sort of back up what Craig has said about the sort of approach being used in Scotland, I think being a different approach from the neighbourhood plans. Uh, a key part of our work over the last four or five years has been, uh, as a third sector organisation, has been helping communities, facilitating them to deliver what could arguably be called uh, community-led plans. The project we did with Isle of Rum Community Trust was the example that the government gave in the uh, early planning review document. Um, 
and I think the, 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 I agree that the, we agree that the figure that has been given in the financial memorandum is probably too low if you want to, particularly if the government wants to continue the sort of quite robust charrette-based approach, which we understand the gov government does. There's been, this year's charrette funding has been tilted towards local place plans. Um, so I think if, there, if there's going to be sort of public trust and uh, robust engagement um, <clears throat> and a sort of plan which is an outcome that the local authority is going to have uh, trust in and respect for, then there does need to be the funding that's been quoted in the financial me memorandum needs to be looked at again. Tommy? Yeah, I just point out that the, the 12 million figure cost to communities in the financial memorandum, I think a lot of that is based on costed volunteer time rather than actual money available to those communities. And, you know, like other stakeholders, Homes of Scotland and our members know that these local place plans have to work if they're going to make communities be more proactively, positively involved in planning and more positively involved in development as a consequence. And I'm concerned that beyond that costed volunteer time, there isn't any firm money on the table in terms of the Scottish Government's support for neighbourhood planning I think in, um, there's huge amounts of money being spent in England on supporting neighbourhood planning. That's been several million pounds a year. Um, and I think it would be helpful if the financial memorandum was able to give more positive confirmation that support of some form and hopefully the scale of that support will be forthcoming from the Scottish Government. There is some comment in the narrative giving examples of where the Scottish Government supports communities at the moment, but it's relatively small amounts that are spent on some design-focused activities at the moment. I think communities, but the wider development community as well, need to see what level of support the Government's going to put into brand new examples of activity, um, such as local place plans. Okay, can I come in again to just to, uh, uh, something else which has been sparked by what's been said? Um, these uh, local police plans are really important. They're one of the sort of game-changing elements of, of, of the planning bill, um, and we need to make sure they work, as has been said previously. Um, I think one of the, the issues which we have is that they are, um, there's a need to try and better link spatial planning approaches with community planning, which takes place across the public sector as well. And there may be opportunities through the local police plans to join some of that thinking up in terms of how public sector or, uh, organisations work together to engage with and work with the communities and then how they, they consider and, and take forward what's been generated by that, that consultation and see how that's split up amongst the different organisations and departments and local authorities as well. So there could be some sort of saving in that but that's very, that very, depend, that very it depends very much, should I say, on um, this idea of place making and communities being at the heart of community planning as well. David? Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, I better let John in first. He's not well, the, you know, I, I'd like to add that, you know, the uh, emphasis on early engagement, uh, you know, that's been uh, recommended through the, the new bill, uh, ties very closely to the idea of placemaking in Scotland. Uh, the charrette process is uh, not adequately funded, in our view, and isn't directly linked to... Uh, local development plans as such, it's uh, very much a, a parallel process. There's a, a very large number of registered community bodies in Scotland. I think we, we became aware that there are something close to 2,000 uh, registered community councils or, or community, community organisations. The amount of funding that's put through those organisations in general is extremely low, and there's a you know, high reliance on uh, voluntary action through communities, and there's a great deal of range between uh, the activities that, uh, and in the time that people invest in these communities. So, in our view, to match the, early rec the, the recommendations and early engagement, we feel that there has to be a more formal means of uh, providing support directly into communities for local place planning. From, John, it's an interesting point you make about LDPs and charrettes being similar in terms of what they, yeah. they do, but obviously I've been involved in the charrette and calendar in my own constituency and it's a very in-depth process yeah. that takes place over a number of days involving lots of workshops across the community for a long period of time involves eventually the production of a high quality re um, report by the consultants involved and then further consultation at the end of all that. Mm -hmm. but, but from what I read from material here, 
that LPPs are not meant to be at that level, which is almost an LDP part of the process, because the LPPs are supposed to feed into the LDPs in future. So to compare it with the charrettes, is it fair to compare yeah. the charrette process with the LPP process that's envisaged? No, well, I think it's uh, the, the point's well made that, you know, charrettes, uh, it's almost an ad hoc process, uh, which, you know, is in, in many cases it's uh, something that's promoted either through uh, local communities, uh, you know, having a voice um, through their own councillors um, to raise uh, concerns, but it is an ad hoc process. It's, it's not embodied in the uh, in the planning system, and we, we feel that a wider, uh, possibly a more um, portable process. I'm, I'm not quite sure how I would describe this, but something that could be applied more widely throughout communities, where especially where housing growth is a, is a requirement. Let me apologise to Neil, I interrupted in the middle of his question session. Um, can, can I just, <clears throat> just follow up on, on something um, Mr McLaren said about um, <clears throat> prioritisation for um, of funding for the private communities? Um, I, I mean, obviously, we've received evidence that, know, from Planning Aid Scotland as well, concerned about you know, uh, more deprived communities being uh, less able to find the means to fund preparation of local place plans. Is is just can I specifically ask you about how how we best support the private communities and, and and whether the rest of the panel agree about prioritisation of funding um, for for more deprived communities and if there's anything else that needs to be done to ensure uh, that the poorest communities engage fully in what has been proposed. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the legislation is not going to cover that. You know, the legislation is going to say any community um, should have the right to prepare a local place plan, and sort of rightly so. Uh, it might maybe have to be the case that um, either at sort of national level, level or local authority level, a decision is taken. Um, like, should we pri prioritise a local place plan towards a particular community um, who we know there may, may be capacity or desire, or it may have been identified through community planning engagement, that there would be a desire to take forward a local place plan. But I, would, I think, um, you know, that's a sort of aspiration that probably can't be put in the, in, in, in the bill. That has to have, be a discussion once the legislation is in place. I think as well you wouldn't want to limit too early where you were going to support local place plans because as well as deprived communities we need to see local place plans coming forward in the areas that are under the greatest development pr pressure which is of, of often you know the opposite of the de deprived communities they're part of a planning solution to a situation at the moment where the planning system's not delivering enough new homes and we know that community views and community concerns are part of the reason for that so if we don't you know support local place planning in the areas where there is that conflict at the moment then we're missing a, a trick in, in, in my mind ideally everyone should have the opportunity every community should have the opportunity to produce a local place plan uh, i don't think we'll have the resources for every community to do that and that's why i mentioned prioritization um my um the reason I'd said that was because um, I feel that some of those areas will have less capacity to deliver that. They'll also have less capacity to maybe crowdfund some money to actually do it as well. Um, and they'll need more intensive work. Um, uh, and there might be more of a need to sort of generate some, some of the discussion around that as well. So that's why I think we think there should be some priority towards some of those more disadvantages. Because in many ways, they are, any, they are areas which need change as well. And that's what planning is all about. Planning is about facilitating change. Well, you know, SP, if we we would agree with that, you know, where uh, local communities want uh, to to be engaged in the, the planning process, they should have the financial means of doing that. That won't apply to every community. Um, you know, there's isn't an intention here to create, uh, you know, a full uh, further tier of the planning system. Um, you know, part of the recommendations in the uh, the review were to streamline. Uh, planning, make it more efficient, but at the same time to allow local communities to, to be engaged where that's, uh, where that's intended or it's wanted by the, by the local community, but that will require some financial commitment from, uh, from government level as well as voluntary services and, uh, and also some cost, and there will be 
further costs on the development sector and the early engagement proposals that are, uh, are being recommended as well. Okay. All right, Neil. Willie. Bruce, uh, it's still on the local police plans. I wonder if I could ask you to clarify a few things that I've just listened to, please. Um, paragraph 58 in the memorandum talks about the estimate that's provided to, to help support the development of the police plans, and it puts that figure around £13,000, and, and it takes that evidence from the, uh, the knowledge we have about Coalfields Regeneration Trusts, which I'm reasonably familiar with from East Ayrshire. Are you saying from your evidence, your experience, that, that that figure is far too low? And could you tell us what examples you've perhaps worked with in Scotland that would suggest it might be higher? Um, yeah, I think there is a, a general trend coming through and the response is that the figure probably is a bit too low. Um, I don't think local place plans have to cost the earth. You know, I think also, as the, the as you the more you do, the more efficient you become. Albeit some communities may only do it do it once, and it then lasts for a certain amount of time. But I think um, Scottish government has tried to do something new through rolling out the charrette approach. Um, and whilst we don't necessarily uh, want to be saying that a local place plan has to be a charrette, I think you know and. Um, as I said, some of the projects that we, we have led are essentially local place plans. And there's a, there is, um, to manage a project like that, um, the sort of figures, that I think, I think I mean, more than double, to be honest, of what the, the figure is quoted there, is what's realistic, 25, 30,000, possibly more. You know, Leith Creative quote the, the figures that of, I think, 40,000 that they were funded to do a sort of urban-based, you know, in-depth charrette process. Um, it's difficult to be prescriptive because every local place plan, I think, will be quite different depending on, on the circumstances. But I think it is... A, Craig, Tammy have said, it, John, it's a big, quite a big change to the planning system and how planning is going to be done. So I think we should be uh, realistic, you know, and ambitious about the resourcing uh, that needs to go into it. One discussion we've had organisationally is whether should does all the fund local authority funding that's going to be. Um, directed towards local place plans, does it all have to come from planning? Because planning cuts across so many different aspects of public life, you know, and transport. Um, I'm involved in leading a community project in Edinburgh, and I know that you have to look across the local authority to sort of see where you might leave our funding from. And sometimes it may well be sort of roads, you know, as well as sort of planning place uh, uh, sections. I think, uh, possibly pick up on that point, you know, for a, a local place plan to, to be meaningful, it has to address quite a broad range of uh, topics that uh, are addressed in uh, local development plans. Planning being the sort of generic uh, heading, but environment, ecology, uh, utilities, drainage and water, transport, education, health. Um, you know, for all of those matters to be addressed, in a local, uh, a local place plan, when you begin to break that down, I think you can see that £13,000 is probably quite uh, a low figure. Um, it's difficult to put a number on it because it's going to change from place to place naturally, but uh, on average we would expect that to, for a meaningful um, development report uh, to be put together for communities, we would expect something in excess of £25,000, 30000 I would have thought. I think the, um, the figure we've been quoting between 20 and 40,000 is just anecdotally from talking to different people as to what it has cost for charrettes. Um, I think it's important um, to bear in mind, as I said earlier on, that, that, that this in many ways is a fundamental part of trying to re reconfigure the planning system to make it a much more front-loaded and proactive service where you try and get discussions about what people want in their community contextualise within, a, uh, within the, the, the framework and the, the resourcing framework and the policy framework and the practical framework which, the, which they the, find themselves in. Th so we can't just use stick and plaster money for this. We've got to invest in it properly and it has to be done properly because it will give a really good uh, fundamental base for, for the, the way in which that place will develop over time. As John says and, and as uh, it's already been said as well, 
and I've mentioned it myself, the idea of trying to link community planning and spatial planning uh, community engagement exercises through charrettes, I think, has got some mileage in it. PAS have already done some work called Charette Plus, which isn't just looking at the planning issues for an area, but it's looking at the issues and it's in the whole, whole round of those areas. And then figuring out, well, how do we take that forward? Is that a planning issue which should be looked at through the development plan? Or is it something to be done through social work or education or whatever? So there is some scope to join some of that up um, uh, uh, through the community planning process, but we need to try and get some, uh, some support to try and push that as a principle across community planning partnerships as well. Have you got any examples that you can tell me specifically where that kind of cost indicator is a valid one? Because we're about to ask the Minister this when he comes in. The, the only figures I've got are in the, the memorandum and the real examples from the Coalfields Regeneration Trust mm -hmm. set around between ten and £15,000 for those plans. So where in Scotland, apart from the, the Leith example, I think you mentioned, David, where else are we seeing local plans like this? And they're not sure it's, let's remember, they're not sure it's, would be given that kind of cost indicator. As you answer that question, can I just reflect on my own constituency, and I've got to bring to bear what I know. And right across my own constituency, in villages, in towns, in bit of the urban bit of Stirling, there are communities right now doing future planning for themselves, producing local plans for themselves, producing local vision documents for what they need for the future. Now, I might be lucky in my part of the world that goes on quite a bit, and I'm sure in other places it don't. And much of that, and whilst these don't, through statutory means, have an impact on the local development plan, local authorities that are sensitive to these things are taking these on board already. So a lot of this work's already going on at a low level in Scotland. What we're doing, as far as I can understand from this legislation, is actually try to turn some of that into a process that actually feeds the system on a statutory basis where people feel they've got a better right. And currently, if I've got this right, there are many local authorities, the national parks, who's already giving officer time to this activity. So if, if that's already going on and it's already happening, some of these costs are already in the system. Is that not the case? It's, um, for the example in the area you've talked about in Loch Lomond and in Calendar, that the, as far as I'm aware, the um, charrettes which have been sponsored... But these are not just charrettes, I'm, uh, these yeah, are, this I understand is that. Lower, lower level yeah, than the charrette process. I'll come back to that, yeah, but the charrettes themselves, they, they've been funded through the Scottish Government mainstreaming charrettes programme, so there's some figures for that, um, which Scottish Government have provided some money and there's been leverage from elsewhere. Uh, so there, there might be some costings you could get, get from that. Um, and PAS have done some work as well, which I think you could look at as well. I think your point about how the, the sort of low-level stuff is going is a very good point, um, and we shouldn't forget about that. There's a lot of work going on across communities trying to figure out what they want for their, for their communities, and that's fed into the development plan system and the planning system. You're right, we shouldn't forget about that. We should be encouraging that. And I, I think the, the local place plans, as you say, in some ways are form, just formalising some of that. Um, and the, the, that, for me, means that the local place plans are best placed if they're at the start of the development plan process and they're inputting to it. One of the issues I think we may have with local place plans is if they come along once a development plan has been published and how you square the local place plan with the local development plan if there are yeah, issues. But, but the problem I'm trying to make, Craig, is a lot of these costs that we're talking about in some areas, these costs are already being are already being met, yeah. and they're already being uh, supported by local authority activity, either by officer time, absolutely, or, or or national park time, or indeed in other ways. So some of that costs are already in the system. I think you're right, but I think one of the Sorry, ambitions of the uh, the planning bill is to um, to further uh, enhance community engagement in the system. Um, so we need to support that as best we can. Yeah, so that, that stuff's all very valid and it's all very good, but we need to try and get more people involved as yeah. well. Yeah. Sorry, Tommy. And I think also it's Im important to note this is meant to put the decision on whether you produce a plan and what type of plan you produce into the hands of communities. So that would be activity over and above anything that's already being led by local authorities. And the way in which local place plans have been set out is, is very flexible. You know, it's almost limitless in what local communities could try and do with a local place plan, but it will be limited by funds. And I think, at the very least, communities are want, going to want to produce plans that are... They're not going to be part of the development plan, but if communities want them to be, they need to be producing something that's development plan ready, really. There's no point spending a limited amount of money on a plan that, if the community then wants to promote that into the local development plan at a later stage, finds it can't do because the robust assessment that a local authority would have to have done 
um, hasn't hasn't been done. You know, haven't looked at impacts or options or, or viability. So, I wouldn't want to limit what a place plan could do. Okay, Patrick. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm. Uh, uh, are you, Willie, are you finished? No, you finished? Sorry. Thank you very Apologies much. Apologies for everybody. I'm just getting. Bit, <laughs> I'm. I'm, 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 I'm into this stuff. <laughs> Convener, I'm delighted that your constituents are so much happier with the planning process than mine are. But um, <laughs> we're happy with the planning process. A completely different thing. Anyway. Um, I was on the the committee. I think possibly in this room uh, that led to the, the 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 scrutiny on the the 2006 legislation, the, the, the last major planning uh, act, and there was a lot of talk then around upfront involvement and proactive front-loaded participation, uh, and it all sounds very familiar. And it doesn't just happen, and I think that's come across through from all of your comments so far. It doesn't just happen, it needs to be resourced. I've got two specific questions about the way it ought to be resourced. Uh, one is about um, who gets to direct that activity, who gets to uh, organise uh, and be responsible for, for financing that activity as well. Do we direct resources, if we can, down to community bodies, uh, given that in some parts of the country there's a healthy scepticism about a, a local council-led process and people feeling led to where the council wants them to go on planning, uh, on, on local plans? or indeed uh, a, about a, a developer-led consultation process in relation to speci specific events and people again feeling that they're being led in a particular way. So should we be re committing resources directly through community bodies? And secondly, where that, that should come from. Uh, I'm a little sceptical that the shift to 10-year local development planning cycles will save as much as is being predicted, uh, whether that resource will just be spent in a different way uh, or indeed whether local uh, development plans being regarded as out of date might lead to more in the way of disputes and conflict, which uh, could increase costs. But if there is any saving from that process at all, uh, isn't that uh, a potential way? Shouldn't we be redirecting money saved from that 10-year uh, cycle into funding communities to engage in the activity that we're looking for? In terms of the, the 2006 Act, even within the industry, we'd agree that uh, the intent that was uh, made there um, on consultation, you know, wasn't delivered because, you know, primarily I think it created a, a kind of one-way process mm. where there was uh, obligations put on the, the applicant uh, to go through a, a process that wasn't necessarily being uh, received. Um, by the by the community, in the the new proposals, I think we can see that uh, it's intended that it would be more of a, a two-way process, and and it would be uh, more like real engagement. But at the same time, you know, the other party, the the, the community, you know, has to be well organised and has to be to an extent fi financed mm. or resourced uh, to be able to. To be engaged in that, I think, in terms of the question that was being asked about um, uh, communities that are al already engaged, you know, we're aware that there are certain communities that are very active, um, and I'm aware of. Uh, I think an example would be Kilmarnock, where they've been proactive, they've created their own local, their own uh, place plan. It's been well received by the local authority. In some other instances. I'm also aware of uh, other communities in different local authorities who have spent a lot of time and effort putting their own uh, vision together on place and it's not been well received by the local authority and it's had no hearing at all in the, the local development plan. So I think you know for each of these communities to have a sort of equal standing, there has to be more of a formalisation of how they, how they would be financed and, and resourced to, to be able to produce their own place plans. I, I think your points about the 2006 Act make it even more important we get it right this time. Because um, uh, uh, there was research published uh, last year, uh, pub commissioned by Scottish Government, which looked at the perceptions of the planning system from communities, which didn't paint a particularly good picture for planning. Um, and I want to change that. Um, I think as a profession, we want to change that as well. I think one of the one of the things I would like to see is, uh, is moving away from a situation where the main 
times that people engage with the planning system is when they have to object to something. It'd be better if we had a, a system where we actually got together at the start of the process and talked about what we wanted for an area, not what we didn't want. And this is where the local place plans, I think, can be incredibly useful, and the charrettes more generally, and a more front-loaded and proactive approach can work much better. And from there, we'd come to agreements and, who, and what we want, um, and uh, who does what, who's resourcing what as well. So I think it's important, I take your point there, and we need to get it right. In terms of resourcing, um, uh, we've already seen some of the, the Scottish Government um, main sheet, main, mainstreaming charrette programme being commissioned directly by community groups themselves. It's not just going through local authorities. A lot of it does, but we've seen more and more community groups doing that. I would like to see that more and more of that happening as well, community groups taking control of it and doing the commissioning themselves and working with, with professionals to help them contextualise what's, what's there. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, I do think uh, if there are... Um, savings to made from 10-year development plan, yeah, it's all about delivering the plan and it's about making, getting the engagement better so we could use some of that resources, as you've said. And as I mentioned earlier, I think there's a, there's a corporate need here to try and realise that planning and placemaking uh, meets many different interests across local government and community planning partners. So we should be thinking about community planning partnerships themselves giving us a priority in funding some of this because it can help them reach the, the issues which they deal with, not just in terms of planning, but in health and education uh, and all these other things as well. In terms of where you would divert the, the, the money savings from plan preparation, you know, we'd agree with what's set out in the, in the policy memorandum that it's important that gets diverted onto delivering plans because plans are not coming forward um, in, in the way they should and that's a problem for development and you know Scotland's housing and economic needs but it's also a problem for communities who are looking to plans to try and predict what's going to happen in the future. Um, but rather than just delivering anything, I mean, we need to be delivering what communities need and we need to be delivering something that developers can work with and are able to, to deliver. Um, under, the, under the new planning regime set out in the memorandum, it's clear that it's going to be a lot more collaborative and front-loaded, and I think that's very important. But the, the government has got, hasn't gone so far as to take planning out of the hands of local authorities and give that to developers or give that to communities but it is clear that it expects local authorities to work more collaboratively in the future. And I think there's opportunities to look at sort of governance models at the local level that bring developers and communities together around tables with the local authorities to have more of a directional and shaping role in terms of what should be the strategy for the area and what policies, <coughs> sites and delivery mechanisms do you need for that. Now, none of that's going to come about from what is set out in the legislation because I think the government recognises that to some extent you need a bit of freeing up of red tape but it absolutely the you know successful future absolutely relies on that happening and again those those that work isn't recognised or costed in the financial memorandum so I don't think it's an issue of taking control and giving that to communities instead or to developers instead it's bringing all those people together and resourcing it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we're an organisation uh, that we um, help communities and individuals with planning, placemaking, but we're also an organisation that has professional planners working with us in a large contingent of volunteers, several hundred vol uh, planners and other uh, professionals volunteer for us to help deliver our services. So we too want to see, you know, a situation where there is public trust in what the planning system is for, which is for making often tough decisions in the public good. Uh, more specifically, um, to the question about resourcing, I mean, I think the 10-year local development plan uh, process, There, I've heard um, some local authorities saying that their expectation might be that local development plan staff might, during that 10-year de period, depending, what ha depending on what, what is happening with the plan, might move towards focusing on planning applications, delivering them forward. But equally, it might be the case that um, a, big a big part of the development plan uh, plan it, excuse me, sorry, the local development plan planners team's role within the 10-year period is is um, actually assisting you know, uh, community groups who are doing local place plans. I think the um, comment about Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park was interesting. If you look at their approach to engagement, they sort of used, I think if I understand correctly, used the charrette process 
um, in some areas throughout the park to sort of create a culture where communities felt supported and actually wanted to go forward and produce their own local place plans. And that is maybe, again, an issue of creating that culture can actually... I think we shouldn't um, underestimate, you know, the importance of volunteering, you know, um, in producing these plans. We were just doing some engagement in Bonness uh, with Falkirk Council Community Planning Partnership on a project um, last month, and seemingly Bonness has won an award for the culture of like volunteering that exists within the town. But that's probably not enough in itself, to, as I've said already, to, to um, resort create the sort of local place plans that we want to see, you know, as a sort of transformational change. Just to back what David said, just to um, say that to, as a measure of the um, importance of community engagement to the profession, 20% of RTPI members volunteer for PAS. Um, for, a profession, for a profession, that's a hell of a lot, about a fifth of people actually volunteering. You can't rely on that for the, for the uh, charrettes, but I think it shows the commitment we have as a profession to trying to make sure that communities are engaged. Patrick? Okay. Tammy, I think you've still got one. Yeah, just one, one point. I think it was one that Mr Harvey raised, um, and the issue of the, the risk of the move to 10-year development plans leading to uh, those plans becoming less relevant over time and community trust falling away. Um, I think we agree that's a definite risk. Um, we, we're concerned about the lack of a clear trigger in the bill for reviewing plans. If, for example, you get to a point where there's a significant shortfall in the housing land supply, um, that's something based on current practice you can easily envisage happening across Scotland. Um, and I think the policy memorandum does say that might be a trigger, but that's not in the bill at the moment. And I think um, housing development and the extent to which that does or doesn't match site allocations, the extent to which it doesn't doesn't match housing supply figures is one of the main issues at the moment where I think community distrust in and dissatisfaction with planning comes from. So I just wanted to agree that that's a real issue and there should be a proper trigger in the bill that, is, that makes sure plans are updated if that, if that happens. John? Um, yeah, if I'd like to add to that because uh, you know I'm aware that the proposal for a 10-year plan has created a lot of uh, debate and probably some disagreement. Um, but uh, you know I, th I think it's intended that there has to be a longer vision, especially in house building and in, in place making, and you know that longer horizon is absolutely critical uh, to be able to produce good places. Um, I think. Another benefit of it, it, it avoids uh, you know, planning authorities regearing themselves every five years without uh, having a, a proper review of what's been delivered, what's been achieved in the, in the five-year plan. Um, in terms of housing targets, um, I think it would be important that there is uh, centralised targets and uh, better updating of housing land supply um, rather being you know, put through a process of dispute every every five years. But I think the review felt that there was uh, improvements in technology where the data can be updated more quickly and housing targets can be, you know, from a central source, can be coordinated better into uh, local authorities as well. But, you know, I think it's, it's recognised, though, and we would agree that... Uh, there has to be an avoidance or, of, uh, or there must be a means of uh, plans being updated uh, sensibly through the, the 10 year period. I think Patrick's got a very small supplementary. I'd like you to do that once okay. Patrick's asked, asked yeah. his question. Thank you. Quick, just just very, very briefly, uh, because you know, I, I don't want to get into the policy discussion about 10 year cycles. That's for the other committee to, to look at. But I, I'm a little bit unclear as to whether the, the witnesses are saying you'd do think the projected savings, uh, the financial savings that the government is, is, is setting out in the financial memorandum will result from this move to a 10-year cycle or whether we should be sceptical about savings on that scale? If I could come in there, um, the savings that are in the bill are only uh, notional insofar as they are savings in, in terms of producing a plan, those resources will still be required to deliver the plan and to deliver and to support the of, of the local um, place plans as well. So for me, it's not saving at all. It's just a, it's a transferring from one budget column to another, essentially. Okay. 
I, I would agree with that. I don't think local authorities are likely to make savings from the change. I think there's new delivery activity expected, and on top of that, there will be some mid-plan cycle updating and refreshing needing to be done. So if anything, there's, there's more work to be done. Yes, in terms of the resource, again, the SPF would, would agree that you know it's not in, it's not expected that resources are going to be taken out of the planning system. We would expect them to be redirected. Now, you know, the efficiency and improvement and deliverability, and uh, you know, targets being achieved throughout a, a ten-year period. I think there are different types of efficiencies that that you know will be achieved, but it won't be on the cost of the resource. I think the, the resource has to be maintained and you know and retargeted, basically redeployed. Okay, that was quite clear. I think in these answers. Well, thank you very much, the witnesses, for coming along this morning. It's been very helpful in producing a report which we'll inevitably do on the financial memorandum. So thank you very much. I suspend this meeting just now to allow a change over witnesses. Thank you.
Okay, colleagues, we'll now continue to take evidence on the Planning Scotland Bill. And for the Scottish Government, I welcome to their meeting this morning Kevin Stewart, who's the Minister for Local Government and Housing, Jean Waddy, who's the Bill Coordinator, and John McNerney, who is the Chief Planner. Welcome to you all. And I would invite the Minister to make a short opening statement, please. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning to you all. Uh, before we get into the detail, Convener, I want to em emphasise that the Bill is just one part of a, a much wider programme of reform to the planning system, building on the independent review that reported in May 2016. The overall review will include changes to secondary legislation under existing powers, policy and guidance, and encouraging broader changes to culture and performance within planning departments. Uh, we want to free planners uh, from the constant round of preparing plans uh, and give them more time to focus on engaging with communities and supporting the actual delivery of development. The aim is to remove processes that add little value and free up resources for more productive activity. Uh, I'm very clear that uh, a strong planning system is needed to support the economy and communities. Uh, and this is not about deregulation or weakening the system. It's about reducing procedure that doesn't add value so that we can fo all focus more on outcomes. Overall, our intention is that these reforms should be largely cost neutral for planning authorities. Uh, but we have to take it in stages. Uh, the bill removes some big for formal processes from the system, so on its own it appears to produce savings. Uh, we expect these resources to be redirected uh, to those other activities that we want to see, uh, but those will be required through secondary legislation or encouraged through new performance measures. Uh, the detail of those is not yet in place and so can't be specifically costed and set against the resources freed up by the bill. Uh, what I can say is that when those detailed procedures are worked out, uh, we will seek to make sure they are streamlined and don't require any more resources than the existing ones while providing a more effective service. Uh, there are also other changes to be made to existing secondary legislation, uh, including to fees and to community engagement requirements. And while these are part of the wider review, uh, they do not arise from the bill and are yet to be designed and consulted on, so they are not included in the financial memorandum. As the bill is only one part in the middle of these reforms, it is challenging to set out how the financial aspects uh, fit together. And that, so I'm happy to help the committee further uh, with any questions uh, they may have on these issues today, convener. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. You referred to costs yourself and um, you know, efficiencies and the potential for transferring costs effectively. Um, I'd like to just start in that area, if you don't mind. Because in paragraph 10 of the financial memorandum, it says Kozlov has suggested that have suggested the timescales for ch changes arising to the bill allow time to undertake fuller consideration of current costs. The Scottish Government will work with COSLA and individual planning authorities to gather more meaningful information on costs as detailed proposals emerge for implementation and development. Um, I just wonder, can you provide any more detail on the work that is going on with COSLA and the planning authorities in that area to gather that more meaningful information on future costs? Because that, and I realise some of that's at this stage can't all be defined, but it would, I think, useful for us to understand where you've got to on that journey. Uh, convener, I'll, I'll bring colleagues in for some yeah. more detail, but I think it would be fair to say, um, since taking on this post, one of the first things that crossed my desk um, was the report from the independent panel into the review of planning. Uh, and since that point, uh, we have engaged with stakeholders uh, throughout the process uh, in order to get this absolutely right. Um, and we will continue um, to do that all the way through this process, not only just during the course of this bill, but uh, I'll, uh, as we continue uh, to change things, uh, including uh, dealing with National Planning Pol uh, Framework 4 uh, and Scottish Planning Policy. Um, in terms of that engagement with local authorities, 
um, you know, uh, my colleagues, uh, my officials uh, engage with local authorities uh, on a, a regular basis. Uh, only yesterday um, I met with the high-level uh, group on performance, which includes COSLA, where uh, it's fair to say that um, uh, discussions around that table are often quite robust. Uh, we will continue to work with local authorities uh, and help, uh, and they will help us uh, shape what, uh, what we uh, require to do uh, over the piece. Uh, and I'll maybe bring in Mr McNerney first um, on some of these issues in terms of cooperation with authorities. Okay, thanks, Minister. Um, Throughout the process, um, from the panel being established um, to where we are today, we've tried to work as inclusively as we can um, with the profession, with other stakeholders. Um, and once the bill um, provisions go through, in whatever form they emerge, um, we'll be looking to provide guidance and regulation across a whole range of policy changes. Um, and in doing that, we've had a series of working groups um, which have met um, a few times now to help define policy and give views across the different stakeholders that have an interest in that. We will re reinvigorate that process when it comes to guidance and to regulations. Um, <clears throat> we regularly engage with heads of planning, with industry, um, with COSLA, with other stakeholders too. Um, and we'll continue to have as inclusive a process as we can do. Um, there's different elements within the bill. Some of those we'll look to co-produce, whether that's the National Planning Framework or guidance or the regulations themselves, and we'll try and be <coughs> as open as we have been in the past. Convener, I should also add that um, in terms of Heads of Planning Scotland, uh, who have been uh, very helpful to us during the course of this program, uh, pro uh, progress here, um, they are currently updating their 2013 study um, on costs and uh, the relationship to fees. Again, that's another piece of work which will be very useful in terms of our moving forward in this. Okay, I believe we'll get into some of the issues that, that, that emerged in our previous discussion. Uh, Murdo, would you like to begin off in the area of infrastructure levy? Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, we heard some um, uh, evidence in the earlier session in relation to the uh, infrastructure levy that's being proposed in the bill. I wonder if you're in a position to share any more detail with us around uh, the infrastructure levy, how, how it will operate, what sort of uh, uh, rates will be set, uh, or how these will be calculated, and what is the aggregate sum you might expect to raise from this each year? Um, convener, um, right along uh, the way, um, I've acknowledged uh, that there's more work to be done on the infrastructure levy uh, to develop a model um, which is fair and practical uh, and does not impact on development viability. Um, I think you heard from witnesses earlier um, around about the uh, study uh, which we undertook uh, uh, which was by Peter Brett Associates, if I remember rightly, um, which is uh, currently uh, available for view on the Scottish Government website. Um, I think that we require uh, more work in this particular area, uh, and that is why uh, we're proposing uh, an, an enabling power here so that levy can be introduced uh, once we have worked out uh, all of the operational details. Um, the model that um, I've talked about, the research, um, shows uh, a, a, a model which has uh, provided some indicative costs. Uh, but that model itself is only one option convener. Um, we'll we will carry out um, a, a full financial assessment uh, and consultation uh, on more detailed proposals um, when that time it uh, comes. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for that, Minister. Um, <coughs> you may or may not therefore be able to answer my <laughs> follow-up questions, but I'll, I'll give it a go, um, uh, because clearly this is very much at a conceptual stage rather than any detail being proposed. But do, do you imagine that this will be um, a levy which will be collected nationally and then divvied out for, on a national basis, or will there be any linkage between uh, how the levy is collected in terms of locality and the investment back into that particular locality? Um, I would expect investment to go back to localities. Um, this was a, a line of questioning um, that uh, came last week at the Delegated Powers Committee as well. 
Um, this uh, is about delivering uh, locally. It may be at a point uh, that some of that money um, is held by Scottish Government. Um, the example that I gave last week at the Delegated uh, Powers Committee was, for example, the Western Peripheral Route, where Scottish Government paid 81% of costs, uh, Aberdeenshire Council 9.5%, Aberdeen City 9.5% um, of costs. There may be um, a good reason for that money to come uh, so that that procurement can take place um, at a national level. Um, but uh, what I can say to the committee, um, and I heard some uh, folk uh, speaking about it earlier in terms um, of the evidence that they give, um, that this is not uh, bonus extra cash um, for Mr Mackay. <laughs> well, thank you. It's that many point, because I mean, clearly we heard this concern that, that this would be money that would be collected would go into the Scottish Government's pot and would be used to displace existing funding around infrastructure. So you're giving me a reassurance that's not going to happen. Uh, that will not happen, convener. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Minister, for coming to talk to us uh, this morning. Just a couple of detailed points to pick up on round about the, the, um, the financial memorandum <coughs> as it stands to, to clarify. On the infrastructure levy, at the moment, that number is clearly an estimate, but it's shown as a cost potentially for developers. And I'm not sure how you format a financial memorandum, but that money clearly would be getting collected and then put back into the system, either at a national or, or a local level. Should that therefore not also be shown as a, as a gain on the local authority side of things? Um, it's not really a gain um, because they have to spend it all on infrastructure. And in terms of the um, financial memorandum itself, uh, in, in terms of the numbers that we have there. Um, those uh, figures that we have are the, uh, from uh, the research that was carried out and the modelling that was done um, by uh, Peter Brett Associates uh, with the, the, the lowest level uh, and the highest level, depending on the modelling that they have. Um, as I uh, said, convener, I think that we have uh, a fair amount more work to do on the, in this area. Um, you know, um, I've made no secret of that right from the beginning. Uh, that's why we're seeking the enabling power. Um, of course, uh, we will continue uh, to consult uh, across the board in this, but this is something that we have got to get absolutely spot on right. Uh, I heard criticism earlier on from some witnesses uh, about the situation um, south of the border, um, where some local authorities um, are currently using the system that's available to them there. Others are not. Um, what I am absolutely determined to see um, is a situation um, which is fair, um, which is balanced, um, and which does not impede development. Um, so, you know, a, a bit more work is required in this area. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I follow through the fact you're going to spend, it means you can't count it as a gain, but leaving that to one side. Um, the fact, because at the end of the day, all money gets spent. Um, the second point I wanted to raise was around... Can I maybe yeah. point, Mr... Um, uh, McKee to mm. um, uh, para 93 in the okay. uh, financial memorandum on this point, uh, which states the income from the levy discussed in paragraph 94 uh, will be payable to the local authority. However, as the income will all be spent either on infrastructure projects or, in, or on administration of the levy, the provisions are effectively cost neutral to local authorities. Okay, okay. Um, the second point I wanted to raise was round about a couple of things that came out this morning. Um, the Scottish Property Federation talked about, and it's in the financial memorandum, 25 to 30% potential project cost savings as a consequence of streamlining measures affected by, by the bill. Um, but that doesn't appear to be in the financial memorandum. And then a second point was raised round about um, other costs that developers may have to incur to engage with communities as a consequence of provisions that were in the bill, which could also be cost to developers, and that also isn't included in the financial memorandum. So I don't know if, if the plan is to assess those and include them, or, or if they're excluded from the financial memorandum. And I'll bring in um, Ms Waddy, and then yeah. I'll make some comment myself in that sure. convener. Sure. Yes, the 
the reference to the figure from the Scottish Property Federation of the cost of delays is really just for context. Um, across the entire um, planning review, you know, part of the purpose of that is to try to reduce delays and make the, the system more efficient. But there's nothing specific we can point to in the bill and say that particularly will remove that element of cost. So that was just really in the financial memorandum for context for the, the wider review as a whole. Right, so you believe there could be savings there, but you don't have enough details or evidence to quantify them and put yeah, them in I mean, the, the FM? The, the estimates that we have from the industry in terms of what those delays cost them, it depends very much on the individual project and the interest rates and all of that kind of thing at the time. So okay, just, and yeah. then on the upside, well, the downside, if you're a developer, the um, additional costs that developers may incur in order to comply with requirements in the bill? Yes. Is that something that's been looked at? I, I think we've considered everything that's in the bill. Some of the things that were mentioned this morning um, was um, additional consultation on individual projects. Mm. That's pre-application consultation. That will be an amendment to existing secondary legislation. Right. And that's, and that's one of the things about all of this, um, convener, um, because uh, there are folks making assumptions around about the secondary legislation um, before uh, we've actually decided um, the, the secondary uh, le legislation. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think that that's always um, uh, particularly uh, dangerous territory to be in where assumptions are being made before um, something is, is even uh, been brought forward. Um, I think that we have been um, very careful in terms of what's in this financial memorandum. Um, I think it would be fair to say that Miss Waddy has uh, lived and breathed uh, uh, this bill and in particular um, this area of, of the financial memorandum. Uh, what I would not want to be stand, uh, stand accused of, convener, um, is plucking uh, figures uh, from the air and adding it uh, into a financial memorandum without actually having um, the 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 the, uh, the evidence to back that up. No, perfectly happy with that, and that, that that's clear. And I understand where you're coming from on that. Just to, just good to get that get that clarified. Thank you. Yeah, no, Simon, no. That's all. Alexander. Thank you, Convener. And as with the previous panel, just note my register of interests around development, construction, and house building. Um, there was uh, some of the evidence heard. There's some concerns about uh, the impact of this on the, on the delivery of housing. I wonder if you'd like to comment on that. Um. And what aspects of the delivery of housing? Uh, in, in some of the costs actually slowing down uh, delivery with uh, local authorities uh, being uh, less able to process applications and things quickly. Um, I, I can't see how that <coughs> can happen, uh, Convener. This uh, bill itself um, is all about uh, taking out uh, process um, and making a, a more effective uh, system uh, with a greater focus on delivery than there has been um, in the past. Um, if we take, for example, um, the move towards uh, local uh, development plans moving to 10 years, all of that is about taking out pro process and focusing much more uh, on delivery. Um, one of the things which um, I'm sure many members will have um, faced from uh, constituents uh, and from others uh, hoping to develop in their areas is that uh, they feel um, that uh, what happens in terms of a local development plan is that one is introduced and immediately um, uh, folk busy themselves coming up with the next local development plan uh, without actually focusing on the delivery of housing and other uh, aspects of infrastructure um, uh, in, in an area. So I, I, I don't know where uh, Mr uh, Burnett is seeing uh, that being said, that it may impede housing delivery. Um, I'd be interested to, to look at that if he has any uh, evidence of, of folks saying that. Thank you. Okay. Um, Emma, I think you are the area you need <coughs> to chat to the Minister about last. Yep, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Thank you for coming today. Um, in the financial memorandum, it addresses changes to the proposed bill under many headings, development planning, local place planning, simplified development zones, um, development management, assessment of planning authorities' performance, and infrastructure funding. So it's, it's all 
complex words and language. And you said in your opening statement that you wanted to remove processes of little value, and it was about freeing resources. So I'm interested in the simplified development zones and the streamlining of those processes to reduce bu bureaucracy. So how will that work? And also, if we create these simplified development zones, how does that protect communities, community action groups, and continue to engage the action groups and the public in uh, community empowerment? Um, convener, um, by creating uh, a simplified development uh, zone scheme, uh, local authority provides the type of development specified in the scheme, um, which are automatically granted planning permission within that zone. Uh, the scheme uh, can set out conditions, uh, design guidelines uh, and other criteria, um, including environmental assessment. Uh, and that, that, that means that anyone wanting to, wanting to develop within the zone uh, doesn't have to make a, a planning application um, and doesn't have to produce uh, various reports uh, and assessments, uh, as long as their proposals are of an of course, in line um, with the original scheme. Um, so all of that done in advance. <coughs> Excuse me. The bill also provides for simplified uh, development zones to grant other consents um, for uh, roads, construction, uh, listed building, uh, conservation zones and adverts. And this will make it, again, more streamlined for applicants. Simplified development zones are, are therefore a way um, uh, uh, for planning authorities to proactively pa plan uh, what type of development is appropriate for a place uh, and make it easy uh, for people to bring forward that development. Um, in terms of uh, the community aspect uh, of all of this, um, obviously um, we have still got some work to do around about certain of these areas, uh, but we'll set out uh, much more detail uh, about the community engagement uh, requirements on the pre preparation of these schemes in the secondary legislation. Uh, but it will include uh, early engagement opportunities um, to formal representations. Um, and uh, ministers may also uh, prescribe certain cases where a predetermination -de hearing should be held before the go-ahead of that simplified development zone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Um, we've heard concerns about um, <coughs> costs and lack of resources, and specifically had concerns about the ability um, of the private communities being able to finance local place plans and uh, building necessary um, skills to prepare local place plans. Um, where, where do you envisage the poorest communities in Scotland finding resources uh, they need to fully engage in that process, and what will the government do to make that uh, possible? Um, convener, uh, as uh, I've stated before, there will be the freeing up of resources, which I would like to see um, going into helping communities and to aid de development. Um, I, uh, I recognise that in your previous session there was a fair amount of debate uh, around about local place plans. Um, I think we have got to recognise um, that many uh, uh, communities across Scotland um, are already um, doing this. And I think you pointed out in your own constituency, Convener, um, and of course, people in Linlithgow um, have come up with their own local place plan, pardon me, in, in recent times without um, uh, uh, very much resource. Um, we have taken a, a view um, uh, uh, in terms of costs of basing that um, on uh, what is happening south of the border in, case, uh, uh, in the case of neighbourhood plans. I've heard what people have said around about charrettes. Not every local place plan uh, will require a charrette. Not every local place plan uh, will require a huge amount of resource in, in, uh, going into it. Uh, because the community themselves may want to drive that local place plan. But I do recognise what Mr Bibby is saying around about um, poorer communities uh, who may not have the resource. Uh, and I would expect local authorities um, to use the resource available to them uh, to target poorer communities or communities that don't have 
um, the, the necessary where for all our resource. I would expect local authorities um, to target um, these communities and divert resources to them. Convener, one of the key things about local place plans, and it was briefly touched upon in your previous session, um, is the fact um, that they should fit in with some of the things that are already going on right across the country. Um, since um, uh, taking this role, since being given this role, um, I've talked uh, a fair amount of intertwining community planning with spatial planning. Um, there are huge amounts of community planning exercises that go on across the country. Um, some uh, local authorities are absolutely spot on in the level of engagement that they have uh, with communities in that regard. What I would now like them to look at, and the legislation will, uh, wants them to look at, is bringing that together. That community planning, that spatial planning together. I think that that will get much more uh, 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 communities involved, many more communities involved, uh, and many more individuals involved uh, in the planning process itself if we intertwine uh, both of these. Um, I think that you know the freeing up of resource uh, from some of the process that is coming out uh, should go um, uh, into uh, 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 local authorities providing resource for local place plans. I would hope that local authorities uh, would divert uh, and target resources at poorest communities first um, because they are often the ones who kind of take part in some of these things because they don't have the necessary wherefore, for all, wherewithal at their disposal. I would, I would you know, very much agree with that. Obviously, you know, we discussed that some communities are already active in this part, but um, as the Royal Town for Planning Institute have said, without making new financial provision to support them, there's a risk uh, they'll be inaccessible to a large number of uh, communities in Scotland. In order for uh, local authorities to be able to target you know, resources in helping the um, most deprived communities, will, will you make a new financial provision from the uh, Scottish Government to do that? Um, convener, I, I won't. Um, I, as I've already said, there will be the freeing up of resource and local authorities um, from some of the processes that are being removed, particularly around about local development plans. I would expect local authorities um, to uh, use uh, their uh, discretion to ensure that that money is spent wisely um, on communities uh, and on ensuring that uh, plans uh, lead to uh, development. Uh, the government itself also provides other resource uh, already um, in terms of um, the Empowering uh, Communities Fund, which is worth some £20 million. Um, and, you know, uh, I think that, as I've, I've stated, I would want resource that is currently being used by local authorities and other community planning partnerships um, in terms of uh, community planning uh, to also be used wisely in terms of um, creating uh, local place plans. It is about bringing these things together. It is about um, diverting resource that's currently going in uh, to other things. Um, and, y you know, I, I think that it's uh, not beyond the, the, the wit uh, of, of folks out there uh, to ensure uh, that we get the most out of the money um, that will be freed up and is available um, uh, to, to get this absolutely right for poorer communities and other communities right across Scotland. Um, can I maybe bring in uh, Mr sure. uh, McNerney to add to that a little bit? <laughs> Thank you, Convener. Um, we do have a smaller amount of money um, within Planning and Architecture Division, which has previously supported charrettes, um, and we've said that we could um, target that to support local place plans in the more disadvantaged communities. Um, there's also a pilot which is ongoing just now with Western Bartonshire Council, which is looking at um, locality plans from community planning partnerships um, and a consultation on local development plans. Um, and we hope that that will emerge um, a local place plan, which helps to join up between spatial and community planning. Um, I know that there's been a lot of focus on charrettes, which have been brilliant in terms of the investment that's gone into them, but they're also very intensive in terms of professional support. There's other um, lower cost options too that help communities. The Place Standard, for example, is a free um, tool that can be used um, in a straightforward way to help communities um, come forward. Um, there's also the, the volunteering aspect that um, past colleagues talked about earlier. So there are different models out with the charrette, um, albeit that 
that having been a very successful one in the past. Okay, we've got a number of people who want to ask supplementaries. Neil, you got any more on this area? Um, Willie and then Patrick, and I'll come to James. Yeah, thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, Minister, we heard earlier in the, the session, I think it was Mr McLaren, who's still, still with us, that engaging early to talk about what communities want rather than objecting at the end to stop what you don't want, I think it's something that we'll all sign up to here, and, uh, and I'm sure that's behind some of the principles in the bill. But, but with that process, I would imagine if you shift the process more to the front end, you must surely shift some cost process to the front end too, perhaps in the area of the development of the local place plans. So do you think your estimate for the kind of average kind of cost of this kind of process is a fair and an accurate one? Because some of the witnesses thought it was maybe a wee bit underestimating how, how much it would cost to do these kinds of things. Sure. I, I think that many of the witnesses um, uh, talked about costs round about charrettes. Um, which, as uh, uh, Mr McNerney said, I think Mr McLaren said, are quite costly. Um, but n not all of these local place plans require charrettes. Um, and, you know, some of the, the base work around about uh, planning um, and the shaping of, of, of places or how folk want to see their, their place shaped uh, of late that I've seen uh, it was actually in Gala Shields Academy. Um, where government uh, have put in uh, some money um, in partnership with PAS to allow young folk there um, to use the place standard in terms of shaping their community. Th that costs, you know, next to nothing. Uh, and many communities use the place standard as a tool on a regular basis. That's free. That costs absolutely nothing. Um, in your own um, patch, um, uh, Mr Coffey, uh, we see East Ayrshire moving uh, quite quickly and, 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 and trailblazing in some regards in terms of the work that it's doing in terms of community planning. I can see um, the spatial planning aspect being uh, brought into that without very much hassle in places like East Ayrshire uh, and without very uh, much cost. I think that even um, the likes of charrettes themselves um, can often be a barrier to some folk um, who don't really understand what it's all about. The word itself has put folk off in the past. I didn't really like it. Um, um, and, you know, I've talked to folk about uh, trying to find a, a better way of describing what it is. Um, whereby a lot of the community planning that takes place in, in local authorities and places right across the country seems to be uh, able to, to bring more folk in. So if we join this, these two things up, um, which, uh, you know, will get more folk engaged in spatial planning than there currently is. I think that's all to the good. And I don't think that that necessarily has to cost huge sums of money. And I don't think that each local place plan uh, requires a charrette. In fact, many places uh, have already created their local own local place plans without any resource whatsoever. And in some cases, wouldn't want the interference from anyone else in terms of the creation of that local place plan. David, the name. Uh, you know, I remember one of the sceptics in one of my own communities said, "Asked me what type of tea dance is that." <laughs> <laughs> so, so there is. A, I think there's probably an issue around that. Patrick, uh, thank you. Good morning, Minister. Um, you've talked in relation to how we how we might resource or how councils might choose to resource that community engagement. You've talked about that in relation to the savings uh, that they uh, are expected to make, or that the financial memorandum suggests they would make from changes to local development plans, and I presume that means the, the shift to a 10-year cycle. I'm looking at the accompanying documents for the 2005 planning bill, which became the 2006 Act, uh, and it says that the um, big debate there was about local plans being out of date, um, and it says that this has led to uncertainty for all applicants uh, for planning permission, as well as uh, for local people. Inquiries are becoming more complex and slower to conclude, and they say that that is in part because 70% of local plans are more than five years old. Now, that was the Scottish Government's view at the time, or the Scottish Executive, as it was called then, uh, and it was a, a generally agreed position that out-of-date local plans were a problem and were causing excess costs in the system. To what extent and how have you quantified in developing this financial memorandum the risk of increased costs in the system through conflict or tension or 
complexity of, of cases as a result of development plans being old. Uh, I'll bring in uh, Ms Wadi and then I'll make comment myself, convener. Um, Fred, I think we'll need to bring in oh, Mr. Sorry, I'll bring in one? Mr McNairney, <laughs> convener. Okay, thank you. Um, so when the 2006 um, bill was going through the Parliament, as you say, the vast majority of plans were out of date. I think 25% were more than 10 years old. Um, and so where we are today, the vintage of plans is actually much better. A approaching 80% of plans are less than five years old, so that's very positive. Um, but one of the key issues with our current plans is that um, there isn't a focus on delivery. And, and that's actually where the panel and, and much of the bill is trying to turn that situation around um, so that we can have more certainty about the, the sites that are in a development plan actually emerging from the ground. And in turn, um, that will not just help um, the development industry um, and agencies, but it will also help communities who hopefully will have more faith in the development plans that that we want to see in the future. So the key thing has been um, the need to Im improve the delivery aspect. And that is linked to um, fundings and perceived savings as well. Our aspiration would be that um, where there's what appears to be a saving from producing fewer plans, the investment in those plans being much more deliverable um, will add value. Um, authorities can still update the plans um, given some triggers, and we can help them um, define what those triggers might be. It could be around um, the emergence of local place plans. It could be because housing numbers are, are not being delivered in the way that they were originally envisaged to be. So there might be triggers. I, that I appreciate that. that. I suppose my question is, if all of that work is happening and that resource shifts from more frequent planning processes in terms of developing plans into... Uh, the implementation of those plans, is there also a risk uh, that we'll see an increased number of applications uh, being passed contrary to local development plans because councils simply decide they're irrelevant now and what was thought about five, six, seven, eight, nine years ago when a plan was developed uh, it needs to be set aside? I, I don't think, convener, um, that local development plans uh, as envisaged under the, uh, the, the new proposals uh, will be irrelevant in any way, shape or form. One of the things um, which um, uh, you come across on a regular basis, or I've come across on a regular basis, uh, not only as uh, a member of this parliament, um, but also as a councillor previously, um, was um, constituents um, who, I have to say, were somewhat frustrated with the system as, as is. Um, you know, we have a situation where folk get involved, um, uh, or, or some folk get involved, in the formulation of uh, that local development plan. Um, that plan is then passed, and then immediately, um, you know, the local authority starts consulting on the next local development plan, um, which folk don't really get, uh, it has to be said. In terms of some of the, the documentation that underpins local development plans at this moment in time, that is extremely off-putting for people. Um, and the key thing for me is to get m many more folk uh, involved. Um, in terms uh, of... Um, uh, our proposals. Um, Mr. Uh, McNerney has talked about possible triggers for renewal. Uh, there's also uh, the gate check uh, process as well, um, which I think is extremely important in all of this. Um, I, I do think that our proposals, uh, as they stand, will make it much more easy um, for ordinary folks to get involved in a process uh, which at this moment in time is kind of difficult for some people to get their heads round. Okay. Uh, the, the, the previous panel acknowledged that the, the savings to local authorities are notional, and if they, if they end up using that money that's saved from less frequent local development plans uh, into other areas of the planning system, uh, then we can, we can understand what, what's stated in the financial memorandum, that the total saving to planning authorities between 21 and 31 million it says, is expected to be absorbed by requirements to be made under regulations. You've also told us that you hope councils will use some of what they've saved to support the community involvement. Uh, are you then able to say 
what regulations you will make which specify how that money will be directed to community bodies to facilitate that work or to fund that work. I'll take in Ms Wadi and then I'll come back in, convener. Yeah. There are existing regulations which set out how a local development plan is prepared and we expect to amend those to increase the amount of um, engagement required in those. Um, we also have um, action programmes which are going to become delivery programmes and again there are regulations about what's in them and, and how they're made and that will say a lot more about how the delivery side should be implemented. And when would you expect to lay those regulations? Uh, I don't have an actual schedule. Yeah. They'll be for further consultation after the bill. After the bill. Uh, well, we'll, we'll provide the committee with more detail around about some, t uh, some Great, of this, convener, in terms of timetabling. I appreciate yeah. that, but it's a, a perhaps well, inevitable. To, to, to be fair, convener, I think it's, it's about I, I the, that. whether the, there will be financial aspects about the, where the money will go that yeah. is being saved from okay. local authorities okay. uh, and whether it will match the, the, the minister's commitment okay. to, to expect councils to use yeah, that I mean, money to, I mean, to finance I community. I appreciate that. I mean, in terms of f f future... Let's sub -legis subordinate legislation that's going to come at a future date. I, I, I mean, I'm here to talk about the bill at this moment in time, convener. Um, you know, uh, we will um, consult further um, in terms of uh, secondary legislation as it's brought forward. And I'm quite sure that uh, this committee and other committees of the parliament may, may want to look at uh, aspects of that at a later date. Are you okay, Patrick? Anything else? Thank you. That's James. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, just in relation to infrastructure funding, in terms of the summary table, uh, the, in, in relation to planning authorities, that's described as cost neutral. Um, but the additional notes talk about the use of uh, a community infrastructure levy. Can you maybe talk through your kind of view as to how that's going to operate? Uh, and if it is cost neutral, how we ensure that there's adequate infrastructure uh, spending coming from planning authorities. I, I should have explained that James has got here because it, after some difficulties on the travel yeah. front because of Scotland's weather and other things, I'm sure. Uh, James already covered some of right, the... Right, OK. Uh, uh, no, I no, apologise. No, but some of that, the, the, the detail of your question that have been covered, but that will obviously be capturable in the official report. So there's there's specific there, though, that James raised. Um, the uh, convener, I, I, I did respond to Mr McKee around about this earlier um, and I, I, uh, I would refer um, Mr Kelly to um, uh, para 93 uh, of the financial memorandum around about this um, uh, which uh, I, I said earlier to, to Mr McKee I won't um, repeat all of that convener. Sure I appreciate that and apologise for my late arrival. Understandable. Anything else, James? No. That's right. Okay, well, thank you very much for the witnesses coming along today. And that concludes our consideration of the financial memorandum. We'll produce a report in due course, and I'm very grateful for you being here. We now proceed into private session. Thank you. Thank you.